constitution of human rights. Are we there yet? With an esteemed panel. Fadi Zagmouth is a gender activist, blogger, and author. His first two novels were bestsellers in the Middle East, and his third novel, Leila and the Lamb, is released in July by Egyptian publisher Kutub Khan. Fadi holds an MA in creative writing and critical thinking from Sussex University in the UK. Can we have a big round of applause for Fadi, please? <laughs> Benjamin Glan is Vice President, Development and Operations of Salzburg Global Seminar in Salzburg, Austria. Previously, Ben served as Senior Program Officer for the Aga Khan Foundation London, where his portfolio focused on development in conflict and post-conflict areas, particularly Afghanistan and Pakistan. Ben is the co-editor of Islamic Law and International Human Rights Law, Searching for Common Ground. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben. <laughs> Justice Roshan Dalvi served as judge of the Bombay High Court for over 10 years. Her judgments include a wide repertoire of socio-legal topics like rights of widows under testamentary laws, Medi mediation and settlement of disputes of women suffering domestic violence, the principle of grant of bail to the accused in cases of human trafficking, human rights of victims of crimes and cases of economic offenses. A big hand for Justice Roshan Dalvi. <laughs> Vinita Deshmukh is a senior journalist of 30 years. Presently, she's editor, corporate citizen magazine. 20 years she has been with the Indian Express and a lot more. Ladies and gentlemen, Vinita Deshmukh for you. I request Vinita Deshmukh to take the discussion forward, please. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to the esteemed panelists. And at first, when Manjuri gave me this topic, I said, oh my God, in this literary festival, I've been given the most serious, heavy weight topic. <laughs> then as I read, I read about them, and I just found that they're doing such wonderful work. And in fact, this human rights always bothers me every day as an Indian. So I just was talking to them that a human rights, what is human rights? According to the UNO, every person born in this world, irrespective of uh, caste, creed, religion, country, age, they are, uh, they have the rights of human rights. However, you know, in India, human rights is looked down upon sometimes. The most recent example is when 52 activists sent a mercy petition to the uh, president of India, when Ajmal Kasab, the only life terrorist, was responsible for 2611 um, Mumbai terror, terror attack. So that's when there was a big debate. But anyway, now that we, have, we are going to have a broad-based approach of are we really there anywhere in the world? So I would like to start from India and request Roshan, who's going to give a PowerPoint presentation. She's given up some uh, wonderful judgments of gender-related issues. So please, Roshan, if you could. Good afternoon, friends. Human rights have been violated through the ages in all the countries, and it is futile to think that there are certain countries or certain pockets in the world only which have aberrations of human rights. All civilizations have had violations of human rights. Now, as a judge, I would see it as a crime. From 1860, about 165 years ago, since that time, we have got the Indian Penal Code, which has got various offenses against human body. Those are the human rights violations. Now, I'd like to show you some of the victims and some of the offenses. Okay, so these are the various victims. We talk about, for example, immigrants today, but even persons in the same country where they live, they are victims of human rights. And next, these are the offenses that we have in our country against human rights.
you see the number of offenses, it sort of travels around the entire lives of people. Now, these are the legal provisions we have. In, I, I won't go through them, but there are a number of legal provisions which protect human rights. These are international covenants, and we have the domestic laws. So these are the main laws, the legal provisions in India. Please go quickly. Now, once a person suffers human rights, I would say there are two tests to find out and to deal with them. One test is the test of lesser numbers, greater attention. That is in every society. When you have in the family, in the schools, in every, everywhere in the courts, wherever there are fewer people, like you have one child, you can devote 24 hours to that child. But if you have got eight children, then they are always more susceptible. You know, they go out and the human rights violations or the child abuse and sexual abuse would be more. The second test is the test of the three R's. And that we always say in courts, you must first recognize that that violation exists, not live in denial. The second thing is, you must learn to resist or tell even children and women and all to resist those kind of crimes. And if that does not happen, then of course you have to report. And once you report, the criminal justice system is set in motion, and then comes the police, the medical officers, the legal officers, and the judicial officers. The judges are on the top of the ladder. Next. Go on, please, quickly. Now, what are you doing? The partners of this system are, one, in the social scenario. That is the family, the teachers, the counselors, etc., and they are for awareness creation. And the other group of partners next are in the judicial system. So when there is an offense or against human rights, then what happens and how many of these officers would be required for that purpose? Next. Next, next, next. Now, what is very important is to understand the impact that this violation has on the victims. So these are what I would say, some of the impacts that I have thought of. There, there are many more. Go on, please. Yes, so go on. Don't see it. You just go on. So these are, wait. These are the impact of human rights violations. You know, the children who come to our courts, the women who come to our courts, they have got sort of confusion, doubt, helplessness, trauma, all of these when they come, and that's what we find as judges. Next. Now, trafficking is one of the worst human violations human rights violations. Children and women are taken as prostitutes from one place to another. Children and men are taken from one country to another for labor. So these are the two main ones. There is sex trafficking and there is labor trafficking. Okay? So you can imagine how these people live their lives. Their entire lives are ruined. There are, we are reported, that there are about 15 rapes a night for a victim of sexual offense when she is trafficked. Now this migrant smuggling is another aspect of human life. People want to be smuggled into another society. It means if initially there is a consent and they want to go, but then they are not taken into those countries for the purpose for which they wanted to go, and they are made to suffer. And years go on, their passports are impo impounded, etc., and they cannot come out of that scenario. These are some of the, the, the sexual and commercial exploitation, which also takes place everywhere in the world against all women and children and against boys also. Now, the main important thing that we find in the courts is that the criminal justice system has got the accused at the center stage. What, is, what are his rights? We always think. We have come of age. So like, like Kasab, for example, he was an accused. But we feel that he is entitled to human rights. But nobody thinks of the victims. 
there is no separate chapter on the victims. In, in, in America, there is an act called the Victims of Crime Act. And the basis of that act is the right of the victim to speak, the responsibility of the nation to listen, which we don't have. And therefore, so many of our judgments now are based on this doctrine of victimology, because we say that victims also have equal rights and human rights, and uh, human rights of women and children who are not heard. Nobody speaks about them, they are, because they don't have the lobbying power. Only the judges know about them when they come to courts. And they are, for every one matter that comes to courts, there will be at least 100 or 1,000 matters that don't come up. So when they come up, we put them separately. The rights of the accused, you go there, you interrogate the accused, you make your case against the accused, and the court will see. So far as the victims are concerned, they don't have to be interrogated. Children victims have to go to the Child Welfare Committee, the CWC, and they are counseled because they are victims. They are taken in as accused, because especially you know the trafficking victim. They are saying, oh, these are the prostitutes. But they are victims, right from the time of Buddha, who said that it was my fault that you became a fallen woman, not your fault. And that is what is not seen. Yes. Then there is secondary victimization in the sense that after the entire trauma is over, the incident is over, the offense is committed, that little girl or that woman has to go to the police station, narrate the story again and again. The police officers are not sensitized. Then she's sent to the hospital. She narrates her story again for the medical report because the doctor asks. Then she comes to court and the prosecution asks those things. The judge takes down her story. So you can imagine the trauma of that girl who has actually suffered and who is cross-examined. So this is the FEDEF principle, the principle of uh, uh, fraternity, uh, of uh, freedom, equality, dignity, equity, and fairness. If you have got these five things, the FedEx, then it's a clean, clear society. And let me know if there is any society which has got all of these five things at all of the times for all of the people. Okay, next. So this action plan would be this kind of brainstorming that we begin to realize that these are the aberrations. We organize against these kind of crimes, and we have a plan of action. Therefore, the need of the hour is the synergy of all the people who come together, not only talk about them in novels, etc., but in everyday situations. And all of these people are the st stakeholders and the state actors against uh, sort of, you know, violations of human rights. I would put that the holistic approach comes like this. These are the various aspects which we get, again, go on one by one. So we move from one to the other, next, an action. And therefore I would say, hear those who cannot speak and listen to those who cannot shout. Thank you. Thank you so much for this in-depth presentation. And while Me Too campaign is uh, gaining worldwide attention, I just remember the Jalgao sex scandal, wherein Miran Borwankar, the police officer, was investigating, and how the teenage girls, she was kept, in, uh, she kept herself in a hotel so that you know, nobody will uh, see them coming and uh, being, uh, you know, talking, complain, making a complaint and how all the 55, 60 girls finally withdrew the complaint because of pressure from the patriarchal society. Now we uh, come to Benjamin, who's done some wonderful work at the global level of human rights. And uh, we would ask him to speak about, are we really there as far as human rights is concerned in the context of the global network? Thank you. Um, quick show of hands, how many people think uh, we are there already with respect to international human rights protection. That's what I thought. Um, no, look, I mean, uh, we're clearly not there, um, number one. Um, this is the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in December of 2018. It's also the 20th anniversary of the Declaration on the Protection of Human Rights Defenders. Um, and 
uh, you know, in this year, if you take a kind of global survey and look across the global political landscape, you would come to the conclusion that human rights are backsliding in many places um, as a result of the rise of authoritarian and populist regimes. Um, you don't have to look very far uh, from where we're sitting now uh, to find examples of that in Turkey, in the Philippines, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, in Latin America. And so, you know, the, the situation is really not very good in many places at the moment. There are um, both examples of countries where we are aware of uh, mass human rights violations, um, and there are ongoing conflicts in countries like Yemen where seven million people are starving, two million of those people are children, a million people have cholera, and um, there is very little, frankly, that's being done about it. And so, you know, the, the context around the protection of global human rights uh, at the moment um, is really mixed. Um, and I guess I would say a couple of things about that. Number one, um, it will probably, to some extent, always be mixed, and, and uh, we will never really truly be there. It's the job of every citizen, of every person, to recognize that the human rights of everyone, the human rights of minorities, the human rights of m marginalized communities, um, are relevant to us and important for the overall health and well-being of the societies that we live in. And number two, um, protecting and supporting those people who are at the front lines of defending uh, human rights is critically important. And so a lot of the work that we do is working with human rights defenders um, and their allies, politicians, journalists, um, artists, writers, to build broad-based coalitions within society that can make, the, make violations of human rights visible and allow people uh, to engage uh, in the legal protections that are afforded to people in the international context, if in fact in the domestic context, countries are unwilling to protect their own people. Um, but we have some real structural problems when it comes to that. Uh, and the United Nations uh, Security Council and the single veto system has prevented, frankly, a lot of um, action at the international level that could have uh, served to protect human rights violations before they occur or while they are occurring. Mm -hmm. um, Yemen is a good example. The Rohingya situation is another. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important to point out a couple of these problems, and those are very linked uh, to the question of the rise of authoritarian regimes because we've seen now the, the largest global international players being unwilling to stand up for the protection of human rights and in some cases backtracking against it even in their own domestic context. And being originally from the United States, I can tell you that, that, is, uh, that that's a very real and very depressing situation at the moment. Um, so uh, before I pass over to Fadi to talk about the, the, uh, the Middle East situation and particularly the post-Arab Spring situation, I don't want to end too much on a pessimistic note, so let me just say this, that um, despite that context, there are a lot of countries, small and medium-sized countries, that are actively working to stand up for the protection of human rights. Liechtenstein, Canada, the Netherlands, mm -hmm. many countries like that that have actually taken action in the international sphere in, the, in, in, in an era in which there is a vacuum of the traditional um, large powers doing so. And so I think moving forward, what we're going to see is a much larger role for smaller uh, and medium-sized countries working in coalition to build broad-based support uh, and find ways that the international system can protect people when their own governments will not. Thank you so much. So there's generally a pessimistic uh, view of the whole thing with a little bit of optimism, which you mentioned at the end of it. And I wonder, you know, I just feel that all of us Indians are uh, victims of human rights violation. We get killed by pothole roads. You know, we don't get our public amenities. I'm sure all that also is human rights violation, if uh, the experts would agree. Uh, so when I come to uh, Fadi, and it's very interesting. He's from Jordan. He have to. He's a blogger, post Arab Spring, and he has you know illustrated there as to how I'm sure Manjiri would not have been able to do a literary festival there. Because every book 
passes through a press department, it is maybe censored, it may be you know, deleted. If your book goes to Jordan, at the customs itself, at the airport, you have a, a censor board through the press department. And anyway, over and above, he has uh, written books and that his latest book is on female sexuality, which is, you know, he's fighting a battle for that. And uh, we would like to hear from him about what is uh, human rights violation with reference to the Arab Springs. Uh, thank you, Bunita. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, ben, uh, ben just told us how the situation is depressing and sad currently all over the world and even in the Arab uh, world in terms of human rights violations. It wasn't the case when the internet first emerged. Uh, at that time, we had uh, lots of hopes of, uh, because we found this a new uh, platform to express ourselves. We, because the previous of that, we had this, these authoritarian uh, regimes who controlled all, everything, all the media, and suddenly we had this uh, freedom and this space to, to, connect, to yeah. connect to the world. Yeah, yeah to connect to the world. And uh, I, I started blogging in 2006. Uh, for me personally, I wanted to talk about uh, gender equality, uh, body rights, and uh, sexual freedoms on my blog. But there are so many other bloggers in the region who opted to, to use the <laughs> blog to talk about human rights violations, about uh, uh, asking for more uh, democracy, uh, and uh, talking about uh, these things. And uh, we, 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 we connected, all of us connected yes. through blogging and also through social media. And I think uh, leading to the uh, Arab Spring, uh, we, we gained strength right. online. And uh, we re it, it reached to a tipping point yes. where, where uh, it happened. It's the Arab Spring uh, started in Tunisia and then it spread all over the Arab world. And uh, the outcome was different uh, depending on each country and how the regime reacted to, to it. Yes. So uh, in, t in Tunisia, the situation is stable now. They have uh, somehow a successful democracy. Uh, in, in Egypt, because uh, the, the president at the time was so smart, he, he just escaped the country after two weeks. He did mm -hmm. it. But in Egypt, there, there was some violence, but also Hosni Barak left. Uh, and then uh, we, we saw how in Syria the reaction was in Yemen and in Libya, so all turned out into failed state. In Jordan, the regime was ve very, very smart. Uh, they were very peaceful reacting to the protesters, even like giving them water and juice mm -hmm. and telling them, just say whatever you want. And <laughs> then after a few years, it faded, all the pro protesters uh, uh, yeah. fade, faded out. So, uh, yeah, the current situation, so for instance, in Egypt, uh, they had democratic election, and then the Musf Muslim Brotherhood took over the country. Right. Uh, it wasn't a happy experience uh, for everyone uh, because uh, we were not prepared. So we didn't have a pot political parties. Mm -hmm. Before uh, the Arab Spring, uh, most of the countries, the, the main political party was Muslim Brotherhood. They were uh, well organized, right. and they been working on the ground for, for many, many years. So when they took over in Egypt, uh, the situation was, was really bad, and people revolted again. And now they have uh, another re regime, which is authoritarian regime as well. And uh, people are a little bit happy about this because he is bringing more stability to the country. But human rights vi violations are on the rise. Uh, many of the uh, bloggers and activists that I used to know, some of them are in jail, some of them uh, escape their country, they are refugees in other countries. Uh, this is the current situation. So generally, the human rights is, is stifled, right? Even if the regimes came after that. Uh, so, you know, I'm just uh, coming back to this, made, uh, I guess it will apply globally also before I come to your two cases. That, you know, one is human rights violation, but one is hiding the human rights violation. I mean, in the sense that, I cannot go uh, and report to the police about se sexual harassment. You know, a girl uh, may be stalked, but she's afraid to do that. In the sense, the social conditioning, the Indian social conditioning is such that you need to suppress. 
Even if your public utilities is your right, you know, you'll just say, oh, yes, the gas cylinder comes after one month, you can't do anything about it. So we learn to accept the violation and carry on as if nothing has happened. So, you know, I think this is like the key to everything that happens afterwards. Do you agree, Roshan? And could you explain? Uh, I agree in a way that crimes are not reported. These are sexual crimes. Please don't say it's only India or it's only Afghanistan. Yeah, that's what I'm asking, yeah. I was just telling them that even if we go to Antarctica, it's going to be the same thing. We are all human beings. The same thing happens in New York City also. There are women who cannot come out and say. Now it's a fashion to say me too, me too. But before me too, there was me no. Everywhere. Now what happens is, as I told you, that impact is a lot, you know, in these kind of crimes. If somebody is murdered also, the other person who complains says that man is murdered. It has not happened to him. So he is not a victim in that sense. But these are the victims of actual violence, okay? Now I had a small child before me a as a judge. Five-year-old child, when she was playing outside the, uh, in her basti, the neighbor came and took her in the, in the room. And he did whatever he did. Now the case was reported, etc. She was 10 years old when she deposed before me, when my son was also 10 years old. And I was just thinking, well, five years ago, my son, how he was, and this little child, what she has gone through. She, I said that I'm going to have this entire trial in my chamber, not in the court where, you know, I sit on a pedestal and then the okay. lawyer shouts and the pr prosecutor shouts and all that. So I went to my chamber, I kept her right in front of me, her mother was there, my steno was there, all the females. She started deposing. She told me about what happened. Mm -hmm. She said that he closed the door, he took out his pants, and he pained me. That's all. And I said, that's enough, because how much more will a 10-year-old girl tell me about the violation that she has suffered? But what has to be done is that in our criminal justice system, you have to point out the accused and tell the court that he is the man who did whatever he did, you know, whatever is the offense. Because otherwise, how is he going to be convicted? So when she had to do that, what I had done was I had put that accused right behind her in my chamber. And I had told my staff to bring him last. So the lawyers were flanking her. I was in front of her. Her mother was at the, in a co corner where she knew her mother was. And the accused was behind her. And all the time, I was completely sort of, you know, staring at both of them. So he behaved well. He could have made some noise, etc. With the result that she deposed nicely before me, thinking that I'm telling this auntie my story when that uncle is not there. And then when, I, then when we asked her, well, who is it that did this? She's saying, auntie, he's not here. He either nahi hai. So I said, no, please get up. See, you're there. He may be there. Otherwise, how do I know? So she got up. And when she turned, she stared into the face of the accused. And I think that itself, that secondary victimization, is the most important violation of human rights. And unless she says that it was this man, actually, I can do nothing. But I decided when I saw her face, that her face is his identification. You don't have to say many things in so many words, but, you can, but it comes out. But she waited for a good long minute, and then she turned back to me, and she's telling me, ye uncle hai. You know that way. So she ultimately said it, I got it in the evidence, I sent him to jail for 10 years, and you know, that, that kind of thing. And uh, I mean, these are all sorts of cases that come up before us. We have got women also, you know, women widows, for example. A woman is not allowed to come into the house. The husband has died an uh, early death, you know, for example. And she's not given any of the properties, etc. In one of my cases, she didn't take the child with her. So the child was reared by the grandparents. And the child was completely against her mother because she said, my mother has done nothing. But she does not realize what the mother could do. She had, she had no home. Mm -hmm. She had nothing. So she allowed the child to be with the grandparents where the child could have been better reared. And the child didn't understand. But I had to find out whether it, whose case is right. You know, that's, that's really our job. 
So she said that I was not allowed into the house, and the grandmother and the child, they said that she went away. So the case that they made out before me was that when the child was a teen toddler itself, she had left and she had gone away. And I found out that that case was not true because of two things, completely latent evidence. Nobody said that before me. This gentleman had a GPF account, the General Provident Fund, you know, which he was going to get. And for those retirement benefits in the General Provident Fund, he had nominated his wife. He didn't change the nomination. Mm -hmm. He died when the child was six years old, when the child wasn't going to school. Now, if the wife had gone away, he would have changed the nomination. But she could take the Provident Fund. And the second was when they said that she got out of the house and she went away, leaving the child behind and things like that. What I found was that there was one slight evidence that when the son died, the mother and the father came into his house. So therefore, he lived in a nuclear family. Now, if his wife had gone away, he would have gone back to his parents, or he would have called his parents in his house, or he would have made some other arrangements which would have come up on my record, but which never came. Now, how did it happen that he lived with his uh, child alone? He was a chartered accountant. Could not have done that. So I realized that this was a false case. And this yeah. woman has given up everything for the sake of her child. Right. She has had no, no, I can home. imagine the kind of efforts that you know you all have to make uh, to bring justice. But uh, before I just uh, come to you, you know, at the uh, developed countries level, I just want to just give a, it's not an anecdote, but it's a true story. The main problem in the Indian society, urban, even urban or rural, is that we do not we want to suppress, and we do not come out and complain. So I was the senior editor in the Indian Express, and one afternoon, my junior colleague, she came in, and she started crying. I said, what happened? So she said, no, you know, since the last three, two days, I've been every five minutes receiving uh, vulgar SMSs. So I said, my God, 48 hours, and you are a journalist, and you are crying? So I, I just told her, I said, just come with me and let's go to the cantonment police station. So she said, oh, my parents won't like it. I said, you are an adult, you are a journalist, and you just have to come with me. So I pulled her along, and I went to the cantonment police station. The constable started telling he's very busy, and I told him, damn, you have to file this message, uh, complaint. So he did that, and all we needed is what, uh, the list from the... Um, telephone company as to who are the people who had, you know, call, call, called up in the last uh, five, six days. And then after I put a lot of pressure, every day has to go and visit that police station. And then they sent this team, they found out that he's from Ahmednagar, and they brought him and they called us. And he was a first year engineering student. And he was so thin that if you did foo also, you'd fall down. And uh, then we asked him, why did you do this? So he said that time there was BPL mobile. So they were given 500 free SMSs per month. So this guy got the number because there was a Dabba wala who used to supply Dabba to the Indian Express uh, you know, reporters. And then he got her number in random and started harassing her. And then, you know, like the police said, do you want to spoil his career? And then we, you know, like uh, explain to him. So the point is that when you do, when you complain, things happen. See, there's no point of one complaint going in one month. If there are one complaint going every six hours, which it happens to the extreme that once, you know, I got a SMS saying that, please read this message only if you're an adult. So I quickly replied saying that I have uh, complained, I put your police, uh, your phone number to the cybercrime cell. So he just called up and he said, ma'am, why have you put my number in the cybercrime cell? You please read the entire message. So the message said that if you are an adult, please read the message and go and vote for the 2010 elections. Okay, so it was like to the extreme, you know, taking it. But I feel that we all should be alert, which we are not. I want to ask you, you know, Benjamin, that in the developed countries like the USA, is, do we have the same kind of inhibitions? Or do you think that people tell me from the primary section, they are taught about uh, you know, good touch and bad touch, and generally it's a free atmosphere, though it's here now. What do you uh, observe about this? Well, I, I think, uh, num number one, two comments, and then I'll answer your question. I mean, I think that the evidence is quite clear across the board that um, 
development, successful development in developing countries uh, depends in large part on the education and protection of girls. And there's uh, a huge amount of evidence to suggest that educating young girls has long-term benefits for societies in a wide variety of ways. And so the protection and security of young girls uh, by virtue of that is primary for any economy to develop effectively. Um, the same can be said about uh, developed countries. And um, in particular, to your question about whether or not these inhibitions are rampant in developed countries, the answer is clearly and obviously yes. They have been for a very long time. And um, the Me Too, ref uh, Me Too movement was referenced earlier. The Me Too movement is, uh, in my view, perhaps one of the most important movements happening today uh, because it's global, it's massive, it's visible, and it's uh, understood in its context that women have been um, abused and marginalized and uh, violence against women has gone underreported and under penalized for far too long in so many countries. Um, and there is now a groundswell that started not necessarily by the Me Too movement, but by the um, movement for civil and political rights uh, dating uh, back decades in most countries. Um, and the, the Women's March after the election, uh, the US election in 2016 was the, the, I think still the largest mass protest on record. And so, you know, the recognition in society that uh, these abuses are taking place, that they're not being reported, that they're not being penalized, has created a space within society for uh, people of all backgrounds and walks of life, but in particular women, to, um, to make sure that those violations are known and transparent and that the abusers are brought to justice. And so, I think that that suggests a ray of hope in the sense that that will inspire other people and other societies and other countries to um, uh, to raise their voice when there is uh, when there is violence against women, when there is violence against children, and so I think that you know the the Me Too movement has has proven to you know have have done a real service I think to uh, to all of us in that sense. And um, you know, you look at countries like France and Canada, who have prime ministers that have um, publicly, in a spot, you know, uh, said that they are uh, feminist prime ministers. You look at Sweden, that has uh, professed to have a feminist foreign policy. I mean, all of these things are really interesting um, and and positive. But there is a tremendous amount of work uh, still to be done on this. And. You know, I think we're, and I hope we're at the very beginning of what will be a, a massive, massive movement for, uh, for the rights of women and for social change around the position of women in society. Uh, thank you so much. Now I will just go to Fadi, and then I think we could open up the floor for questions. You know, interaction would be more um, interesting, and we would know what they want to uh, find out. So. Uh, you know, the thing is that I want to go out of this gender. Gender, of course, the gender issue is the main form of human rights violation. But I feel that as a citizen, whatever you do not get after paying your taxes, that I think is human rights violation. And also, uh, ours, like many other countries, like yours, are a patriarchal society. So we have our political leaders, influential men, who like make nasty remarks even after some sexual harassment case or you know rape. So, uh, do you what what is your observation of the men's mind in your region of the world? And do you think there has to be the change? Because here you 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 said that you know oh you wore a short dress and that's why you're raped. You know things ridiculous things like that. So what do you make of a man's mind? And do you think the man should change his approach? The first. The mother should change the approach, the way she brings up her son, or you know, treat the brother is treated. What is your idea? Uh, I think it, it, it has it has to be uh, it's a burden on both genders. So it's it's a, a heritage of cultural values uh, where you, you can find women who think uh, uh, that she's more uh, like masculine thinking more than men and. Uh, yeah, it's bad across all. So f for me, uh, 
changing, and cultural change is very important. It's, it's the most important to fix our society, to have more uh, healthier societies, because uh, we grew, uh, most of our public schools are segregated. So men and women uh, grew, uh, grow up without really knowing the other gender. And this led to, to, to many problems, uh, like sexual uh, harassment yes. uh, in the street, uh, distrust between men and women, uh, and other, uh, other issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks. You know, uh, just last, I want to ask Roshan, is that do you think the Bollywood songs have an impact on your women, you know, sexual harassment on women? <laughs> Roshan? I don't see Bollywood movies. <laughs> I don't know much about Bollywood songs. I cannot sing a single song. <laughs> but uh, I think Bollywood does send messages, good, bad, and ugly. Right. Uh, OK, so it's been uh, a very interesting and insightful uh, uh, talking to all of you and giving your views. So we throw the floor open for questions. Yes, please. Mike, please. So please tell your name. Make the question short. Uh, my name is Bredja Sorensen. Uh, my question is uh, a consideration, perhaps, for Mr. Um, Roshan. Roshan, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps Ready? Buddy as well. I'd like to hear a couple of uh, you know, angles. Yes, there, there is a very uh, uh, unused tort law or civil law, often the uh, duty to rescue. Uh, which is very never touched in criminal law or abuse cases or sex cases, uh, sex attacks or human rights issues or anything like that. And I wonder what your thoughts are on making, you know, an approach to the resolution of, you know, lacking of human rights more a legal issue that the laws like this are put in place and it's a demand put upon people surrounding, you know, because like this Me Too movement, Everyone knows how much was going on. Nobody said a thing. So where is the duty to rescue? Where is the responsibility on everybody surrounding an individual? You know, how are, how are children taken? How are girls put into the sex trade? How are men, you know, kidnapped and taken to, a, a, you know, for work, labor, you know, kidnappings and so on? You know, where is the duty to rescue? Where is the community spirit? Where is the individual responsibility? Yeah, Roshan. Uh, in individual cases, this rescue comes from the victim or the close persons to the victim. Like a mother, a teacher, a guardian, an NGO would kind of rescue her from a particular situation and complain. In trafficking cases, where we have brothels, etc., where we have labor, so for even child labor, for example, for boys, then there is a rescue team. So there are NGOs who work on them. There are some dedicated lawyers also who practice on them. They find out about where this kind of brothel is or where this kind of kiln is, where the bricklaying and all that children are. And, all. and they take the police to rescue. Now when, when you rescue, the, let us say about 56 girls are rescued. So formerly what used to happen is they used to be taken as accused along with the accused only. And then one advocate will apply for bail for all of them, with the result that once the bail is granted, this brothel keeper would put them in the same jeep and take them back to the same brothel. It was as bad as that. But now that we have got this segregation, which I showed you, for the accused separate and for the victim separate, and there is a system of victimology, when they are rescued, then they are rehabilitated. So there is a rape, there is a rescue, then there is a rehabilitation. And in the meantime, the prosecution goes on. And one of the girls who was rehabilitated today is a jet airways um, air hostess. There are several girls who have gone into, say, tailoring, and they've done fashion designing, and they've done beautician courses, they've gone to colleges. They are put up into the mainstream again after they have been rescued. Yes, yes. Would you like to add, Betty? Uh, yes, uh, it, it, this is very important. But I, 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 I certainly want to stress again that we need we need to work on the mentality and the culture first. For instance, in Jordan, uh, like the state it tries to protect women who get sexual abuse or, or being raped by putting them into custody. So they end up uh, pr 
uh, jailing women, like uh, limiting their freedoms to protect them from their family, killing them because they got raped or get sexually abused. We also had uh, this article in the law uh, 308. Uh, it burdens the rapist if he agrees to marry the woman that he raped. So now it changed, but this is the mentality because uh, they want to protect the woman from her family uh, to kill her if they because uh, she lost uh, her honor. So. Right. Yes. Uh, okay. You know, you get the cam mic. <laughs> mic, please. <laughs> after that, you could ask. Yes. After her, you can ask. Hi. Thank you. Um, all really interesting um, viewpoints. Um, what strikes me is that you're all from different continents, so different cultures, different histories, different backgrounds. Um, but what seems to come out, is particularly Fadi, you said that um, kind of human rights campaigns seem to survive on attention. And if you starve them of attention, that's when things can backslide, to use your word. So I'm kind of wondering if it's the job of the people at a grassroots level to make these changes. And if so, does it come... We're talking about an international movement that you were saying, Ben, that, that you'd quite like to see that there's an international kind of network. Is that, is that possible at a grassroots level, or do you think it's more of the responsibility of the state? I, I, think, it, I think it is possible. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and may, maybe just a, a couple of anecdotes. I mean, in our work with human rights defenders, one of the things that we found is that the, the greatest protection that can be provided to internet, to, to human rights defenders in a variety of contexts is international visibility and international networks and international contexts. Um, so at an LGBT uh, lesbian human rights activist working in Uganda, for example, who Fadi knows, um, is it, homosexuality is, uh, is, um, is criminalized in Uganda. Um, and she's out and open and a, a well-known international advocate for uh, the human rights of the LGBT community in Uganda. And I asked her if she was worried about getting arrested and put in prison and prosecuted under the law. And she said, no, the police can't touch me because they know that if they do, the German ambassador and the Swedish ambassador and the US ambassador will be on the phone immediately. And so if you compare that with LGBT human rights activists in Ethiopia, for example, who do not have the kind of international visibility, international contacts and connections and networks that are required to support and sustain them, then um, they're in a position where if people don't know that they're there, if people don't know that they're working uh, to support the human rights of the LGBT community there, but the police do, well, that's a very combustible situation for them. And so there is a role to play, my, I think my point is, there is a really important role to play both in a national and community context uh, with respect to the protection and support of human rights defenders, but there's also a really important role for the international and diplomatic community and international organizations to provide the kinds of support and networks and visibility for human rights defenders that enable them to work, that enable their work to be known, and that actually serve as a really important protection mechanism for them. Yeah, so I guess, you know, we just need it at every level, right from the grassroots to the state, to the nation, to the international uh, places. And now with uh, technology, it's so easy, I think, to connect. But it should be implemented on ground. And yes, ma'am, you wanted to ask a question. Could you give her a mic, please? Hello, everybody. Uh, my question is for Roshan. Um, as you quoted about that case where the lady was widowed and thrown out of her house, <coughs> I'd like to know, is there a law which entitles, I was given to understand by a lawyer friend that uh, after the husband, the ancestral property does not go to the woman, to the wife. It goes to the children. And she has no right over the ancestral property. But in case a husband dies, 
and there is property in his name only, which is not ancestral, and he does not leave a will. Can the woman claim that property? The wife, that is the widow, the children, and his mother share equally. In fact, it, it's, a, it's a very best law in India. When a man dies, this is what happens. So in, in my case, this uh, property of his went to the wife who was thrown out of the house, the daughter who was six years old at that time, and his mother, equal, because he had not left a will. If it was his self-acquired property, he can leave a will. If it is his ancestral property, it means he has not purchased it. He has not made it out of his own toil. Therefore, it goes from the propositors to the different generations. And therefore, it goes to the girls and boys. The woman has a right to matrimonial home or shared residence. She cannot be thrown out. But she doesn't get ownership rights. But I think that's a property law and not human rights law, actually. But that's how it is. Thank you. Yes. It's all women who are asking questions. How about some? Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, just give him the mic, please. So while we're talking about human rights, uh, we haven't discussed a topic on uh, war crimes. And uh, when I see war crimes happening in Africa or maybe Sri Lanka or maybe any parts of the world, do you think there's an imbalance between developing countries like Sri Lanka or Uganda being prosecuted for war crimes and not US and not Russia? Because they are committing war crimes equally. We have seen that in Vietnam. We have seen that in Syria. Are they not being prosecuted? Or, I think or is Benjamin, there an imbalance? Benjamin would like to answer. So it's, not, it's a tough question. Um, yeah, I, look, I mean, I think, yes, there is an imbalance. Um, I think if you look at war crimes tribunals and the International Criminal Court, um, the court uh, has been set up uh, to prosecute crimes against humanity and to prosecute crimes committed during conflict and war. But the court can only act if the national courts and national jurisdictions will not. And um, so that has been a key part of the international jurisprudence when it comes to the establishment of the court. Um, and, uh, but you're right, there, there are historical incidences and, and some recent ones where countries such as the United States have committed atrocities during wartime and have not been brought to justice in front of the International Criminal Court and have not been willing politically or legally to take steps um, to address that. And so, yes, there is an imbalance. I don't know what more really to say about that other than um, I think that you've hit on a, an important um, issue. Um, and you know, the issue uh, is one that relates to what I was mentioning earlier about the UN Security Council where larger and more powerful states have, a, have more of a prominent role in deciding what happens in the international system. And I think there is a really urgent need to uh, reform that system uh, because it doesn't function uh, for uh, the common good in all cases. Uh, so we now take the last question quickly. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Dipali. And I would like to ask a simple question at an individual level because I'm a college student. And I would like to ask you that how could I spread awareness among the students or uh, my friends about human rights? That's nice. This is a good question. I think yeah, you can write. Maybe you can start uh, on a blog. You can uh, talk about this, share it on social media, connect with other uh, uh, same-minded, same, same ac activists in your community. That will help. Thank you and so you know much. what, you, could, you, you should just tell everybody that it is a crime to take injustice lying down, whether it is a pothole, whether it is talking, whether whatever. So you just say that you need to act. We should not keep quiet, you know, just act. And you know what I do? I use the Twitter. And it is so effective. When I've gone to a restaurant where the food was bad, whether it is the uh, Uber car, whether it was the Indigo Airlines, you just use Twitter. Use the social media, it's just wonderful. And they, every uh, company has now a uh, social media department, and they quickly get back to you. Thank you, and uh, I thank all the three panelists for this wonderful session. And I hope that you all are enlightened, since you all have got so much insight, and you all will be 
proactive citizens and not passive citizens. That's where the human rights violation will start ending. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. Thank you so much to each and every one of you for your enlightening words that helped us in opening the closed windows of our minds. Can we have a big round of applause for all the speakers?